On this week's boiler tip, we're gonna take a quick look at wiring. Many a time when you've got a boiler down, we open up a panel and it may look like this or worse. And the issue with that on an actual boiler is most of this wiring is hidden in conduit. So it's, it's not so easy to follow a wire from one switch to another. So an absolutely invaluable asset for your boiler room is <laughs> the burner wiring diagram. It might be obvious that we should have a diagram of how our boiler is wired, um, but in, at many sites those have been lost uh, to the years. And so the importance of a diagram is it really accelerates troubleshooting. Um, on a unit without a print, I've got to chase wire through conduit to find which in a series of switches is tripped. But if I've got a print, I can simply look at uh, the limit series and I can take a meter and simply test terminals in the panel and quickly narrow down where that problem is. So uh, a troubleshooting event where I don't have a print, I could spend two hours identifying a switch that's got me held out with a drawing that matches the panel that's current. I may be able to find which switch is holding you out in two minutes. So it's a night and day difference. It's worth the investment to find or recreate or have uh, drawings reprinted um, for your equipment. Let's look at some of the symbols that we're likely to see on a wiring diagram. There's a lot of different shapes of, and types of symbols that we'll look at, so we'll look at some basic ones. The first is a simple switch. So if we show contacts and we show a switch, um, essentially, because there's nothing connected to the switch, that's gonna be a manual toggle. So, for instance, the burner on-off switch could be represented like that. If we've got a switch like our first low water cutoff switch, um, generally those are floats. Um, and we can illustrate that on a diagram by having a round float shape. So if you think about a float ball, when the water level comes up, it breaks or makes the switch, depending on whether it's a high alarm like I've drawn here or a low water cutoff with the float rising to make the switch. So the symbol impacts the function of the switch, but also the orientation whether it's a normally closed or normally open switch. Um, if we've got a pressure switch, that's often uh, drawn as a half circle. Um, one way I like to think of that is like an old fashioned oil can where you push the bottom of the oil can to squeak out a little oil, that's how that works. So this is in a normally closed position and a rise on pressure would trip that switch, so that would shut us down when we had excess pressure on the boiler. In many cases, if it's a secondary high pressure switch, we'll put an MR underneath the switch illustration. That just indicates that it's a manual reset switch. And there are instances where we have manual reset switches in the standby circuit. So even if the boiler's in standby, it doesn't mean that there's not a switch out there that could be tripped. If we've got a temperature-based boiler, we'll often have a little zigzag line on the bottom. If I've got relay contacts, it's gonna show up as an open contact. So that would be pretty typical on a probe-style low water cutoff, where we might have an electronic-based uh, switching system. Um, or it could also represent any type of relay contact in the circuit, whether it's a building management system that opens and closes, or it's a contact on a, a latching relay alarm or something like that. So we'll look for switches like that. An additional type switch that we'll sometimes see is a sail switch. And usually what that indicates, like a little flag, that the wind is blowing. So we'll frequently see these on combustion air proving switches, whether it's a sail or pressure type. Sometimes a combustion air proving switch will have the half dome shape because 
it is actually pressure based or it could have a sail if it's actually got a mechanical sail in there. Floats by and large are used exclusively for level alarms. Um, pressure switches could be that combustion air. It could be high steam pressure, high, high steam pressure. Um, it also could be low oil pressure if we've got a low or high oil pressure switch on a boiler. So we'll see recurring instances of that. We could have a temperature switch as the operating limit on a hot water boiler, or we could have it as a low fire hold on a steam boiler. So there's a lot of applications for the different switches, but that's a quick summary for you. But if we don't have a wiring diagram, what can we do now to streamline troubleshooting in the future? And, and one thing that we can do is test limits, which we need to do anyway, but when we test those limits, make notes um, because there are essentially two limit circuits that constitute 90% of our boiler failures. We're out on a gas pressure switch or we're out on an operating pressure switch. Um, a flame safeguard control will identify which of those limits we're in by going into a standby mode or going into a lockout mode. So if we simply trip the boiler on each individual limits and kind of make a laundry list of what response we get to each limit trip, then we'll basically have a cheat sheet for the future so that when we're down on a particular limit string, we at least know which switches we can check. So I'll demonstrate that by tripping this boiler on high steam pressure. So I'm increasing the pressure. We're going to trip on this switch. There we've shut down. We've gone to post purge. And then standby. So our operating pressure limit, OPL, um, is in our standby circuit. So that's one of the candidates to troubleshoot if we're in a standby mode. If I disable my blower motor during purge, our blower motor starter interlock is going to trip us out. So we're going to get a lockout interlock. So we'll add that to our lockout list. If we blow down the boiler and trip it on the primary low water cutoff, We're back to standby. Now I'm going to trip the high gas pressure switch. We've gone into standby again. Okay, so now that we've tripped all the limits on the board, we basically have a list of what switches are in each interlock circuit. And so we haven't cut in half what we need to check, but we've definitely minimized what we need to check for getting a running interlock fault. So. Not as good as having a diagram, but better than having nothing. <laughs>